dear students let us discuss one more module in image based questions in general surgery this is module number 7 and we are going to discuss the case scenarios in so case number 1 25 year old gentleman complained of constipation and severe anal pain following defecation these are the two pictures and these are the four questions what are common causes for perianal pain okay right so the common causes are anal fissure anal fistula but anal fistula usually there won't be any pain only perianal abscess and thrombosed hemorrhoids these are the three conditions that will produce acute uh, pain around the anus what are the possible diagnosis based on the picture one here so it looks like a thrombose pile mass or perianal hematoma or thrombose pile mass or it could be even a perianal abscess the cause for perianal hematoma is obscure but what happens is thrombosis in a subcutaneous vein below the dentate line perianal abscess result from infection of the anal gland in the crypts at the dentate line so what what, what is the treatment for this condition it may resolve with symptomatic management although during this time they may rupture and it may get ulcerated also if the pain is very severe the hematoma or abscess may be drained so uh, what is the treatment they are doing in this picture so here they have done <coughs> maybe they have done a deroofing of this hematoma you have to make an incision you have to press this area and you have to remove that clot that blood clot because it's it got clotted that blood inside so you have to remove it deroofing the hematoma with the exclusion of the blood clot which is often described as block current yeah that clot looks like a block current so it's called the, and then usually there'll be a inside there'll be a bleeder so you have to uh, i mean control the bleeding you have to do hemostasis and then only it will stop case number 2 these patients presented with perianal discomfort see there are two different patients so you are seeing something in the perianal region this is nothing but prolapsed pile mass yeah this is prolapsed pile mass what is the symptomatology since it is prolapsed hemorrhoids third degree piles are reducible whereas fourth degree piles means it is irreducible what is what is the symptomatology patient may have excruciating pain bleeding and itching prolonged straining at what is the cause for this problem prolonged straining at defecation constipation and pregnancy all risk factors are the etiological factors for development of hemorrhoids <coughs> how will you manage this problem yeah what are the predisposing factors okay how do you manage this condition if they are reducible you have to advise on bowel regulation patient should take high fiber diet and avoid prolonged straining is is sufficient if they are irreducible then surgical resection is mandatory hemorrhoidectomy should be done uh, what are the complications of uh, uh, complication may arise after surgery so early complication okay bleeding infection and acute retention of urine due to post op pain late complications it could be incontinence because of injury to the sphincter complex fecal incontinence and anal stricture formation because of excessive removal of the anal mucosa that leads to scarring okay these are the complications case number 3 you are seeing some equipment used in the outpatient surgical clinic so you have to tell what is on display in picture 1 so you are seeing so many things here this is a proctoscope and this is a barrens banding set okay you are seeing the gun also here barrens banding set that is what you are seeing here what is it used for it is used for so what is this kit contains proctoscope rubber band and applicator and and the uh, rubber bands itself so this is the rubber bands this is the uh, applicator 
and this is the proctoscope. Okay, what is the purpose? It is used for what? For diagnosing and ligating or banding the hemorrhoids. So what are the different degrees of hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids are engorged vascular cushions found within the submucosa of the anal canal. They are found at constant position within the anal canal at 3, 7 and 11 o'clock position. So there are four degrees of hemorrhoids. First degree, there is no protrusion of the hemorrhoids at all. Second degree, okay, it is protruding outside, but it is getting spontaneously reduced. Third degree, okay, this is also getting purla, purla, protruding outside, but it requires some manual uh, reduction. Whereas fourth degree, even manually, it is also pro prolapsing outside, but even manually, we cannot reduce it. So how will you do this Barron's banding? Barron's banding should be applied only to first and second degree hemorrhoids and not to third and fourth degree hemorrhoids. Why? The first and second degree hemorrhoids are above the dentate line and they are insensate. So you can apply the bands and this will be painless. Whereas the third and fourth degree hemorrhoids are below the dentate line and they are sensate. If you are going to apply the bands, they are very painful and patient will never come back to you again. That is the problem. So you have to apply this Barron's banding only to first and second degree hemorrhoids. What are the other therapy uh, apart from this Barron's banding? Are there any other non-operative treatment? Yes. Injection sclerotherapy, 5% phenol in almond oil or arachis oil can be done. This is only for first and second degree uh, hemorrhoids, not for the third and fourth degree hemorrhoids. Infrared coagulation also can be done in early stage of hemorrhoids. So how will you uh, prevent the formation of hemorrhoids? Proper advice to avoid straining and they have to avoid constipation also. Okay, these are the things they have to avoid so that uh, they can prevent the formation of hemorrhoids. Case number four, this is a 40-year-old diabetic man present with severe perianal pain and swelling of two days duration. There is no history of abdominal pain, diarrhea or blood in his tools. On examination, perianal area reveals an erythematous tender area about 1.5 cm. You can see it here. Perianal area, erythematous and tender. Gentle palpation is excusatively painful. Preclude precluding any further, preventing any further rectal examination, okay, because it's very painful. What is your diagnosis in figure 1 and why you are saying so? Because you are seeing a swelling there, the skin is erythematous. So this looks like uh, a perianal abscess. Based on the clinical scenario, okay, it is perianal abscess, a subtype of anorectal abscess. Because patient is a diabetic patient, is complaining two days duration of perianal pain and swelling. There is 1.5 centimeter size uh, tender swelling over the perianal area. Could not do parietal exam because of severe tenderness. Okay, there are how many types of uh, these abscess are there? There are four subtypes to this anorectal abscess. This is called Pox classification. They are number one, the perianal abscess just below the skin. Number two is intersphincteric abscess in between the internal and external anal sphincter, ischiorectal abscess in ischiorectal fossa, and pelvirectal abscess above the levator ani. This is what you are seeing here. This is this is the intersphincteric abscess, perianal abscess. This is the ischiorectal abscess, and this is the pelvirectal abscess. These are the four types of uh, anorectal abscess. Number three, what is the ETO pathogenesis of this problem? How will you manage this condition? So in the wall of the anal canal, a variable number of anal glands, 4 to 10, have direct openings into the anal crypts at the dentate line. Infection of these anal glands lead to anorectal abscess. Okay, that is why to begin with, uh, the, this anorectal abscess will form intersphincteric abscess. The, from the inter Sphincteric abscess only, it will spread to other areas. What is the treatment? Treatment is 
primarily you had to do incision and drainage anti and then only you had to give antibiotic after drainage <coughs> given to patients with antibiotics should be given to patients with cardiac valvular abnormalities or patients who are immunocompromised intercentric and pelvirectal abscess they are drained under ultrasound or ct guidance because externally you cannot see any swelling in case of intercentric and pelvirectal abscess only in perianal and ischiorectal abscess you can see obviously swelling outside so you have to drain them only under ultrasound and ct guided guidance what are the complications of this problem the commonest complication after surgery to this anorectal abscess <coughs> is fistula in ano however experienced or skillful the surgeon may be they have to face this complication if the abscess cavity has an internal connection either to the rectal canal or the anal canal so nobody can avoid this one so you have to warn the patient when you are going to do a drainage of the perianal abscess you have to warn them 50% of them may result eventually they will uh, res result in fistula in you know you have to tell to the patient case number 5 this is a 60 year old woman present with soiling of the under underwear with blood and fecal matter she mentioned a hospital admission 3 months ago with perianal pain and swelling that was treated with incision and drainage most probably a perianal abscess for which ind was done what is your diagnosis with this i mean clinical scenario and this finding so you are seeing a probe they have inserted inside and from perianal skin and it is coming inside the anal canal so this looks like a fistula in ano okay that is a diagnosis if the external appearance is like figure 2 what could be the cause here you are seeing only one fistula whereas here you are seeing not one fistula you are seeing 1 2 3 3 fistulas opening you are seeing so what are the causes for multiple this thing if you are seeing a single opening in the perianal skin the complication this is a complication of anorectal abscess which is having an internal connection either to rectal or anal canal if you are seeing multiple openings in the perianal area area then it could be because of crohn's disease tuberculosis or it could be hydradenitis suppurativa what are the different types of these fistulas here also four types this is also pax classification intersphincteric fistula transphincteric fistula suprasphincteric fistula and extrasphincteric fistula the most common fistula are the intersphincteric and the transphincteric fistula so here you can see this is this is a <coughs> transphincteric fistula uh, this is extrasphincteric suprasphincteric fistula this one so these are the four varieties of this uh, pax classification how will you man what is the good sals rule so good sals rule relates to the external opening in the perianal skin of the anal fistula to its internal opening it states that if the perianal skin opening is posterior to the transverse anal line the fistula tracts will open into the anal canal in the midline posteriorly sometimes taking a curvy linear course a perianal skin opening anterior to the transverse anal line is usually associated with a radial fistula tract you can see it here so if the opening is posterior to this line see it is taking a curvy linear course and it is opening only posteriorly in the midline whereas if the opening is anterior then it is having a internal opening just radial radially it is not taking a curvy linear course if it is an anterior fistula this is what is called good sals rule <coughs> how will you i mean manage a case of fistula in ano first thing is you have to define the internal and external opening <coughs> and identify the relationship of the fistula tract to the sphincter complex fistulotomy means laying open of fistula tract in superficial and intersphincteric fistula you have to do only fistulotomy fistulectomy means 
completely excising the whole fistulous tract, again in superficial and intersphincteric fistulae, you can do this. What do you mean by C-turn? Drainage C-turn means to drain the fistula and then cutting C-turn means for control cutting of the sphincter complex in stages. Because if it is a extra sphincteric fistula, then you should not cut the uh, whole tract at a time. You have to cut only 50% of the fistulous tract with the C-turn and then you have to tie it. After a uh, few weeks, maybe after at least minimum two to three weeks, then by this time the upper part would have been healed. So now you have to cut the lower part so that the whole sphincter won't get cut at the same time. The patient won't go for incontinence. That is the idea of using this seton. And the latest technique is called lift. What is lift? Ligation of intersphincteric fistulous tract. You have to go in between the external and uh, internal sphincter and then in that area, you have to ligate this fistula strike. This is what is called lift procedure. Or you can do what is called endoanal advancement flap in which we, we used to close the internal opening. You have to close the internal opening, that's all. Fibrin glue can also be injected into the tract to obliterate the whole tract. Instead of fibrin glue, you can use bioprosthetic plug also. Patients who own tissue is placed throughout the fistula tract. So all these are recent advances. Case number six. 23-year-old lady described excruciating pain with defecation and blood streaks on the outside of the hot stools. So this is very classical. What is your diagnosis with this history and this, these pictures? So you are seeing here an ulcer in the mucosa, yeah, here in the perianal region. Here also you are seeing, but you are seeing something else also. So what, what is uh, your diagnosis? This is called fissure in Yeno. The based on the clinical scenario and clinical picture, it is fissure in Yeno, which is an ulcer in the lower portion of the anal canal. Because the patient is having constipation and passing hot stools. Excruciating pain while passing hot stools. Blood streaks on the heart stool, that is bleeding PR or bright red blood per rectum. But it is not a massive bleeding, unlike the, uh, I mean, diverticulosis or angiodysplasia. So what is the cause? Most tasks of the anal canal are due to passage of large heart stool or explosive diarrhea. Trauma to the anus or tear during the vaginal delivery also can produce this one. And... Acute fissure in Yeno, symptoms, that means symptoms within six weeks. Local examination reveals fresh ulcer without any induration. The another type is chronic fissure in Yeno, where the symptoms are more than six weeks. Local examination reveals triad of hypertrophied papilla fissure and then the sentinel skin tag from above downwards. Primary fissure occurs without association with other local or systemic disease, whereas secondary fissure means occurs in association with some other underlying disease like the Crohn's disease, tuberculosis, leukemia, or aplastic uh, anemia. How will you manage this fissure in you know? No, uh, okay, before that, I want to show you the three parts of this is the hypertrophied papilla, this is the fissure. And this is the sentinel skin tag. Here you can see it. This is the hypertrophic papilla. This is the fissure. And this is the sentinel tag. This is, this is in case of chronic fissure. Whereas in acute fissure, you won't see this. You will see only the ulcer. Ulcer is also not indurated. You won't see any hypertrophic papilla or the sentinel skin tag. Okay. How will you manage this condition? Non-operative treatment for all acute and some of the chronic fissure in you know, can be done. Why? That is sits bath, antibiotics, you can give laxative, high fiber diet, local application of nitroglycerin or diltiazem and injection of botulinum toxin. This is for acute fissure. How will you treat chronic fissure? 
anal fissures usually heals in 6 weeks time surgery is not usually required unless the conservative therapy fails for chronic fissure you have to do what is called lateral internal sphincterotomy that is the surgical procedure of choice if the anal sphincter tone is normal this can be done as a open or blind subcutaneous lateral internal sphincterotomy if anal sphincter tone is low then you have to do an endoanal vy skin flap that is what you have to do case number 7 28 year old man present with symptoms of recurrent pain swelling and discharge around his natal cleft figure a is the clinical picture what is your diagnosis you are seeing this is natal cleft you are seeing one hole here or one fistula here or sinus here and you are seeing some more sinuses laterally so with this clinical scenario and this clinical picture this is a pilonidal sinus okay what are the risk factors <coughs> for this pathology young male patient those who are hirsute or hairy people deep those who are having deep natal cleft and occupations like those who are drivers barbers those who are sitting for a long time okay what is the etio pathogenesis the hair penetrates the skin of deep natal cleft and uh, natal those who are having deep natal cleft that produce dermatitis infection pustule formation and then sinus formation hair gets sucked in by negative pressure in this area further irritation and granulation tissue formation happens then first forms inside multiple discharging sinus the primary sinus usually in the midline the secondary sinus occurs laterally that is in the paramedian uh, area so uh, the, you have to define the anatomy of the uh, tracks can use methylene blue and then you can excise the midline pits avoid midline wounds uh, midline wounds by using lateral incision you have to flatten the natal cleft you have to minimize the dead space keep the area clean and free of hair post operative period so this is this is the principles of surgery and how will you manage this what is the treatment excision of the sinus plus or minus direct closure this can be done or you can go for what is called carry dockis flap this is what you are seeing here you have to make an incision like this not exactly elliptical this is just vertical incision and then curved incision so the closer this skin the the suture line won't be in the midline this will go to this side right side see here this is what is called this is the uh, how you have to uh, you have to undermine this thing you have to so that the suture line it will it will be here laterally and not exactly in the midline that is carry dockis flap the bascom's procedure is this one you have to make lateral incision okay and then you have to go in you have to remove everything you have to make this incision also you have to remove it and then you have to close only the midline incision and not the lateral incision you have to keep it open so you have to i mean remove all the pus and hair here this is what is called bascom's procedure and another one is a advancement flap surgery this is called limberg flap or vy advancement flap you have to make a diamond shaped incision like this including all the all the primary and secondary sinuses in this natal cleft area so you have to make an incision like this you have to excise the skin and then you have to make a rum, uh, rectangular shape i mean incision here you have to make you have to make a marking in the skin like this then this flap you have to you have to elevate and you have to just rotate this flap so that it will cover this raw area this raw area and then this this area you can close primarily and this is what is called limber vy advancement flap case number 8 this is a 72 year old man complained of protruding mass after defecation see you are seeing the mass here this is quite obvious 
what is seen here this is a case of rectal pr prolapse so rectal prolapse means protrusion through the ns of either the rectal mucosa that means partial thickness prolapse or the whole rectal wall that is full thickness uh, prolapse what are the symptomatology patient may have pain bleeding mucus discharge and anal incontinence uh, what are the etiology for this one it could be because of rectal intussusception poor anal sphincter tone chronic straining due to constipation or pelvic floor injury these are the etiology for the rectal prolapse obvious prolapse you can see what are the clinical features you can see it clearly decrease the anal sphincter tone will be there you can see the mucosal folds they are concentric and in female patient you can also see uterine prolapse or a cystocele indicating weakness of the pelvic floor in female patients what are the complication of this rectal prolapse okay the rectal prolapse may bleed it may go for incarceration sometimes small bowel evisceration in intussusception okay the whole bowel may i mean come outside uh, uh, how will you manage this case in a fit patient a trans abdominal rectopexy plus anterior resection may be considered the different types of surgeries are wells ripstein and goldberg freckman procedure different types of surgeries you can do where you have to do your rectopexy using some mess yeah different techniques that's all wells ripstein and goldberg freckman in an elderly who is unfit you have to do the perineal surgery that is you have to excise the proctectomy can be considered here also there are various procedures known as delarmis thiers procedure and altimere in thiers it is called thiers wiring you have to reduce the prolapse you have to make a encircling i mean with a either cat gut you have you can do it with cat gut thiers procedure yeah you have to do a pursing suture almost like pursing you have to do it case number 9 53 year old man complained of massive painless br bpr that is hematochesia or bleeding pr following investigations were done this is the colonoscopy so this is the clinical scenario what you are seeing here all are diverticulosis yeah here in the second picture you are seeing bleeding okay here this is uh, what is the etiopathogenesis of this condition risk factors lifestyle low fiber diet muscle wall weakness and increase intraluminal pressure due to constipation diverticule occur in areas of muscle wall penetrated by vasa recta <coughs> what you are seeing <coughs> in the picture here you are seeing a barium enema in the sigmoid colon you are seeing this is what is called short tooth appearance yeah short tooth appearance uncomplicated diverticulosis usually will be asymptomatic 72 sorry 70 to 80% episodic abdominal pain often left lower quadrant pain bloating flatulence constipation and diarrhea may be there absence of fever and leukocytosis in uncomplicated diverticulosis no physical examination finding or maybe a poorly localized left lower quadrant tenderness that's all if it is a complicated diverticulosis okay patient may go for bleeding bleeding diverticulosis 10 to 15% of these patients or it can go for infection and inflammation that is called diverticulitis in 15 to 25% of these patients if it is diverticulitis 25% of which are complicated will go for complication like abscess formation producing intestinal obstruction perforation and even fistula these are the complication it can go for diverticulitis go for bleeding 5 to 15% of the Uh, diverticular can go for bleeding this is painless rectal bleeding 30 to 50% of them are massive lower gi bleed usually you need not do anything within 3 days spontaneously it will stop very rarely okay patient may go for diverticular colitis with 
diarrhea, tenismus and abdominal pain. Uh, uh, in uncomplicated diverticulosis, you can advise them to go for high fiber diet and you have to educate them. In diverticular bleed, usually in initial workup and like any other thing, you need not do any surgery. Spontaneously it will stop. If hemorrhage is not stopping, then only you have to do the endoscopic procedures, you can try. Normally we won't do any surgical intervention, open surgery, yes. Case number 10, 50 year old female patient present with left lower quadrant pain for three days. Pain is constant, moderate and does not radiate anywhere. Patient is also having low grade fever. No history of bleeding PR, mild tenderness in left lower quadrant. CECD images are shown. So what are the findings in figure 1 and figure 2? You are seeing something here. This is CECT and here also. So what, what is this? Figure 1 shows thickened bowel wall and facial infiltration of the mesentery. So it is uncomplicated acute diverticulitis. Figure 2 shows abscess cavity with presence of multiple air bubbles. So it is a case of complicated acute diverticulitis. So what is the reason? Erosion of the wall by increased intraluminal pressure or inspissated food particles. Inflammation and focal necrosis. Maybe it is maybe a micro or macro perforation. Usually mild inflammation with perforation is walled off by the pericolic fat and mesentery. Abscess formation, fistula and obstruction can also ensue. Poor containment result in free perforation and peritonitis. And number three, what are the clinical features of this condition? And the investigation also. What are the clinical features? Depend on the severity of inflammation and presence of complication. So it ranges from asymptomatic to generalized peritonitis. Uncomplicated case, left lower quadrant pain, tenderness in two-thirds of the patient, constipation, diarrhea, and urinary symptoms. Uh, in uh, low-grade fever may be there, mild leukocytosis, and occult or gross blood in the stool. Rarely this coexists with acute diverticulitis. In acute diverticulitis, what is the different grading? Acute diverticulitis, you should not do colonoscopy and varium enema for fear of perforation. If you are suspecting acute diverticulitis, shouldn't do colonoscopy and barium anema. The gold standard investigation is only CECT. And this is the staging of the disease or grading. Stage 1, yeah, this one, you are getting only pericolic or mesenteric abscess here. Yeah. Stage 2, walled off, again it is walled off but only confined to the pelvic area, pelvic abscess only. Stage 3, generalized Purulent peritonitis, stage 3. And stage 4, generalized, but now it becomes fecal peritonitis. These are the four, this is called Hinchy's classification of acute diverticulitis. Uncomplicated case, how will you manage this case? Uncomplicated, you have to do conservative management. Outpatient, yeah, you can give clear fluids only until improvement and you can also give antibiotics. Hospitalize the patient Treat with NPO, IVF, and IV antibiotics. Image guided percutaneous drainage of the abscess reduces the urgency of surgical resection in most patients. What are the indications for surgical intervention? Unstable patient with peritonitis. Hinges stage 3 and 4. After one attack, if immunosuppressed, and in three or more attacks of diverticulitis. Complications like perforation, abscess, fistula, intestinal obstruction, hemorrhage, inability to rule out colon cancer. What surgery you have to do? For unstable patient or complex cases, you better do just Hartman's procedure. Otherwise, you can do colon resection plus colostomy and rectal stump. This is what is uh, what, what you should do. Colostomy is reversal in three to six months. For more stable patient, okay, with Hinchy stage 3 and 4, acute diverticulitis, you can, you can do colon resection and primary anastomosis. In already prepared large bowel, you can do it. 
plus you can do diverting loop ileostomy. This is more common nowadays. Coming to case number 11, 65 year old man come to the hospital with unexplained anemia and he has got unintentional weight loss of more than 20 kgs in two months. The diagnostic workup of colonoscopy and barium anemia were shown here. This is a colonoscopy, this is a barium anemia. What are the investigations and findings in figure 1 and 2? In figure 1, you are doing a colonoscopy. This looks like, yeah, you are obviously, you are seeing a tumor inside the colon. Most probably, it is from cecum. And here, you are seeing this is a barium anemia. And, okay, this is transverse colon, this is ascending colon, this is cecum. Here, you are seeing a filling defect here. Okay, are you able to see? This is the filling defect. What is your diagnosis? Okay. Colonoscopy, okay. Most probably, it's carcinoma of the cecum. This should be confirmed by, of course, colonoscopic biopsy. Reason for this diagnosis is an elderly person presented with unexplained anemia and intentional weight loss of more than 20 kgs in two months. The workup of both colonoscopy and barium anemia are showing definite growth in the cecum. However, the diagnosis should be confirmed by colonoscopic biopsy. Okay, so what is, what are the different modes of presentation of this pathology? I mean the colonic CA, how it will present? Okay, you just see this one. Or this is called colorectal carcinoma. If it is a right colon, the incidence is only 10%. That is what in this patient, it is a cecal carcinoma, it is a right colon cancer. Mass or lump in the right iliac fossa, it can present like that. Or anemia due to protracted occult blood loss. This is how our patient presented. Pyrexia of unknown origin. Sometimes appendicitis when carcinoma occludes the appendicular orifice and weight loss. These are the clinical features. If it is a right colonic cancer, if it is left colonic cancer, the incidence is 30%. Pain in the left iliac fossa, which is referred to the suprapubic area. Alteration in the bowel habit. Okay, patient may have both constipation and diarrhea. This is the most common symptom. Palpable lump in the left iliac fossa here. Loss of weight and small caliber stool or pencil thin stool. These are the characteristic feature of left to colonic. Yeah, uh, a colonic tumor. If tumor is in the rectum, the incidence is 60%. Okay, patient may be passing blood and mucus per rectum. This is the most common and earliest symptom. Patient is also will be having what is called tenismus. Tenismus is a very characteristic symptom of rectal growth. Okay, patient will have, even after passing stool, they will have inadequate passage of the stool. That is what is called the inadequate sensation of passing the stools. That is the uh, uh, tenismus. Sacral or perineal pain may be there. Of course, weight loss will be there wherever may be the can cancer or carcinoma, the weight, history of weight loss will be there. So what is the staging system for this cancer? What are the different stages? There are three staging systems are there for colorectal cancer. One is Duke staging, another one is modified Ostler collar Duke staging, and then the TMN staging. So this is the staging, A, this is Duke staging. So in it is involving only the mucosa. That is stage A. Invasion through the bubble wall, but not invading the lymph node. This is stage B, grade B, yeah. But no lymph node is involved. Uh, this is B1. But in B2, okay, it is invading, it is going outside. But no lymphatic, I mean, B2 is penetrating through the muscularis propria. Nodes not involved. Okay, that is uh, B2. C1, okay, it is it is uh, only up to the muscularis, but nodes are involved. Whereas C2, okay, it is uh, penetrating through the muscularis, but nodes are also involved. Whereas D is distant metastasis. This is the modified Ostler collar classification, okay. 
Here we are having only A, B, C, D. There is no subtype in B and C in Duke stage, whereas in Osler collar modified Duke stage, you are having B1, B2 and C1, C2. Okay. This is this picture you have to remember. This is the staging. So what, how will you manage this condition? Immediately after colonoscopic biopsy confirmation of the diagnosis, you should do staging of the disease by appropriate investigations. Right? What you have to do? You have to do either um, um, you have to do CT of the abdomen to rule out any secondaries in the liver and chest X-ray and bone bone scan, all those things you had to do, you had to do to rule out any distant metastasis. Late cases, we had to do only palliative treatment. In early case, okay, only surgical intervention is done. Intervention is done. If it is a cecal or ascending colon carcinoma, then you have to do radical right hemicolectomy because our patient is a cecal carcinoma, you have to do, or even if it is in ascending colon cancer, you have to do radical right hemicolectomy. If it is hepatic flexor carcinoma, you have to do extended radical right hemicolectomy. Yeah, this is what you have to do. So case number 12, 55-year-old man, come to the hospital with history of altered bowel habits. See, here it is left-sided problem. That is why altered bowel habits, constipation and diarrhea. And he is also passing bright red blood per rectum on and off for the past two months. A diagnostic workup of colonoscopy and barium enema are shown here. These are the two things you have to do, but nowadays there is no need for barium enema. Colonoscopy is the gold standard because you can see the tumor and you can do the biopsy also. This is the gold standard investigation. There is no need to do barium enema nowadays. The, what are the investigation and findings in A and B? Okay, this is colonoscopy. You are seeing a tumor. Yeah, just below the splenic flexure. So in this picture also, you are seeing just below the splenic flexure, you are seeing a uh, filling defect here. This is what is called <coughs> apple core appearance. Uh, this is classical. This happens only in tubular variety. Okay. Yeah. Most probably carcinoma of the descending colon. Risk factors for colorectal cancer or FAP, that is familial adenomatous polyps. Those who are having Lynch syndrome or HNPCC, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or patients who are having IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, especially ulcerative colitis, exposed to ionizing radiation, bile acids and alcohol. These are all predisposing or risk factors. What are the four varieties of this uh, colorectal cancer. Annular variety in barium enema, it shows like napkin ring, ring appearance. This is annular variety. Whereas the tubular variety in barium enema, it shows apple core appearance here. And the ulcerative variety is, okay, ulcer-like. And the proliferative or cauliflower-like growth, these are the four varieties of colorectal cancer. <coughs> Number four, what are the different modes of presentation of this pathology? Emergency or electively. Emergency as acute large bowel obstruction or perforation and peritonitis. As an elective case, okay, change in bowel hab habits, constipation and diarrhea, pain abdomen, bleeding PR or tensile thin stool. If patient is presenting with bowel obstruction or perforation, that is emergency presentation. Okay, pre-op preparation, how will you manage this case? Pre-op preparation, you have to get the informed consent. No need for mechanical bowel prep. Solids up to six hours before surgery, liquids up to two hours before surgery, and enema two hours prior to surgery. Radical left hemicolectomy should be done. Number six, is there difference in principle with laparoscopic technique and what are the advantages of minimally assessed colorectal resection. Advantages of minimally assessed colorectal resection are decrease wound related complication, reduce cardiovascular, respiratory and thromboembolic complication, reduce incidence of incisional hernia and of addition related complication, 
there is no difference in the overall and cancer specific survival and increased incidence of port site metastasis use of ERP early recovery protocol along with minimally assessed resection is complementary in reducing the risk and maximizing the benefits for the patient case number 13 55 year old man has come to the hospital with history of passing bright red blood per rectum on and off for the past two months and tenismus for the past one month diagnostic workup of coronoscopy and mri scan of the rectum are shown here because mri is very helpful here not barium enema here rectal carcinoma what are the investigation and findings in figure one two and three so figure one is showing coronoscopy showing an ulcero proliferative growth in the rectum figure two is mri scan of the pelvis sagittal view you are seeing the rectal growth invading the mesorectum here here you are seeing this is the sagittal view this is the coronal view uh, and figure 3 is the uh, MRI of the uh, uh, pelvis only, coronal view, rectal growth invading again the mesorectum with lymph nodes in the mesorectum. This is T3 and 2. Most probably the diagnosis is rectal carcinoma. Reasons for the diagnosis is an elderly patient presented with bright red blood, rectum and tenismus, and with altered blood, hab uh, altered uh, bowel habit also. Tenismus is the hallmark symptom of rectal growth. That is the sensation of incomplete evacuation of the bowel even after passing stools. This is because of space occupying tumor in the rectum. Colonoscopy clearly showing the ulcero proliferative growth. Tissue diagnosis should be confirmed by biopsy. MRI scan, both sagittal and coronal views, reveal rectal growth and involvement of the mesorectum also. So what are the other workup you will do to rule out secondaries? You can do colonoscopy to confirm the diagnosis, CCT of the abdomen, chest and pelvis, MRI scan of the pelvis, CT brain, whole body bone scan, CEA that is carcinoembryonic antigen, chest x-ray and examination under anesthesia. All these things for staging purpose. How will you manage this case? Once all the investigations are completed, the patient should be discussed in a hospital tumor board and treatment should be tailor-made. This is not a general treatment that will fit for all the patients. So every case should be discussed by the tumor board in the hospital and they have to decide. If there is no distant metastasis and the circumferential margin is not threatened or involved, the patient is offered a short course of radiotherapy for five days followed by anterior resection. In this case, if it is a rectal growth, if the tumor is in the upper third of the rectum, high anterior resection with tumor specific mesorectal excision, TSME is performed. If tumor is in the middle third of the rectum, you can do low anterior resection with total mesorectal excision and covering loop ileostomy. If the tumor, tumor is in the lower third of the rectum, you cannot do anterior resection. You have to do only abdominoperineal resection with permanent end colostomy. All these operations can be performed using minimal accessory, minimal assess technique also with a laparoscope. Or nowadays they are doing robotic surgery also. What is the prognosis? If it is stage 1, 90 to 95% 5 year survival rate. Stage 2, 60 to 65% 5 year survival rate. Stage 3, 40% 5 year survival rate. Whereas stage 4, only 20 to 30% 5 year survival rate. Going to case number 14, the 38 year old male patient complained recent history of large mass protruding out of anal canal. History of high-risk sexual contact with other men positive. On examination, large fungating mass protruding out of the anal canal. You can see it here. The perianal region, you are seeing a large fungating mass here. With this clinical scenario and the clinical pictures, 
what is your probable diagnosis and why you are saying so? What are the two types of this pathology? The most probable diagnosis is anal carcinoma. Reason, mass is in the anal area with bleeding. Patient has high risk sexual contact, putting him at risk for a human papilloma virus infection, which is a risk factor to develop anal carcinoma. This cancer can develop from inside the anal canal or from anal margin. What are the two types? AIN is anal intraepithelial neoplasia is a precancerous condition and is graded from 1 to 3. Depends on the degree of dysplasia in these epithelial cells. These changes are driven by human papilloma virus stereotypes 16, 18, 31 and 33. And number three, what are the risk factors for this pathology? Human papilloma virus infection type 16, 18, 31 and 33 and 35. The mode of spread is sexual intercourse, especially anal intercourse with females and homosexual activities in males. HIV, all HIV exposure categories, including female anal intercourse and men homosexual activity, injection, drug abuse, blood transfusion. These are the risk factors. Smoking and tobacco use, five-fold increase for cancer. Benign anal conditions like hemorrhoids, fissures and fistula are not associated with increased risk to develop the anal cancer. What are the clinical features? Patient can present with bleeding PR as hematochesia, uh, bright red blood per rectum, this is the commonest symptom. Or they can come with pain, tenismus, pruritis. <coughs> Mass in the anal area. Mass in the inguinal area because of metastasis to the inguinal lymph node. Diagnosis can be confirmed by taking a biopsy by proctoscopy. Staging can be done by CECT and tap of thorax, abdomen and pelvis. That is the uh, a CT scan of uh, CT tap. You have to do CT tap, that is thorax, abdomen, and pelvis CT. CCT of tap. An MRI tap and PET scan also you can do. What is the treatment? Treatment of AIN, that is anal intraepithelial neoplasia. You can do local surgery. You can do photodynamic therapy or local immunomodulator like immune. Q mod you can use. Treatment of invasive cancer, chemo radiotherapy, this is known as Negro regimen. So what you have to do? Okay. Combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, this is called Negro regime regimen. 5 fluorouracil mitomycin or bleomycin plus cisplastin and adriamycin. Along with this chemotherapy, you have to give radiotherapy for 3 to 6 weeks. Reassess the tumor. If obvious tumor remains, you have to go for AP resection. If there is good response, only you have to excise the scar. So radiotherapy is the main treatment for anal cancer. Only those patients who are not responding to radiotherapy, you have to do the AB resection. Okay. Patients who are, won't respond to the chemotherapy, nigro regimen or T4 tumor, adenocarcinomas, immunocompromised patients, those who are having fistula also, and those who are intolerant to chemo, uh, chemotherapy. So, salvage AP resection involving Excision of large area of ischiorectal and perirectal fat and skin can be done. The perineal defect results after this radical AP resection should be closed by plastic surgeon by flap cover. The 3 to 5 year survival is 50% depends on the ability to completely remove the tumor at the time of surgery. That is R0 resection. If you are able to achieve the R0 resection, then the survival rate at 5, at five year is 50%. Case number 15, 28-year-old man presented 
5 years back with loose tools bright red rectal bleeding and passage of mucus for few months he underwent a major bowel operation where large bowel was removed and he had a temporary stoma in the right atrial fossa for 3 months which was subsequently closed he is well and is on regular annual follow up since his operation at the age of 21 years his father died at the age of 38 years from bowel cancer what is the investigation in figure 1 and the findings what is there in figure 2 and the findings so this is colonoscopic picture figure 1 it is showing the whole colon is studded with numerous polyps the figure 2 is showing resected specimen of whole of large intestine up to ns total proctocolectomy specimen if there are more than 100 polyps covering the colonic mucosa it is called familial adenomatous polyp if there are fewer than 100 polyps it is called attenuated familial adenomatous polyp with this clinical picture along with the colonoscopic features and resected specimen and the diagnosis diagnosis is familial adenomatous polyp he is a young man with strong family history of colonic cancer presented with bright red blood per rectum loose stools and passing mucus colonoscopy revealed numerous polyps he underwent total proctocolectomy and under regular annual follow up what is the genetic behind this uh, fap fap is an autosomal dominant inherited disorder characterized by adenomatous polyp distributed throughout the gi tract predominantly in the colon and rectum there is mutation of apc gene located on chromosome 21 22 it is associated with what other problem congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium ch or pf congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium gardner syndrome and turcotte syndrome <coughs> how will you follow up because it is familial Uh, how will you follow up the family family is kept under surveillance by offering the offspring uh, the colonoscopy from the age of pu- puberty and genetic testing is performed if the abnormal gene is present then you have to do prophylactic colectomy what is the definitive treatment for this patient definitive management is either colectomy with ileo rectal anastomosis often followed at a later age by proctectomy with ileo anal pouch procedure or an initial primary proctocolectomy with ileo anal pouch procedure with covering loop ileostomy colectomy with ileo rectal anastomosis preserving the ano rectal function is a safe operation with minimal complications and the functional results are better because there is no pelvic dissection In these patients, the reported incidence of rectal cancer is 30 percent at 20 years. The operation of proctocolectomy and ileoanal pouch removes all colorectal mucosa prone to cancer and avoids a permanent stoma. Also, coming to case number 16, 38-year-old woman complains of blood-stained diarrhea with passage of mucus. Mucus. on and off for 6 months she passes 4 to 6 loose motion a day this is associated with tenesmus and generalized vague abdominal pain and a feeling of ill health she has lost some weight and recently found a raised tender red swelling on her skin what are the investigation figure 1 and figure 2 and the findings so figure 1 is colonoscopy figure 2 is barium enema So, figure one is showing a reddened, edematous, and hemorrhagic rectal mucosa. Yeah, most probably ulcerative colitis. Figure two is showing barium enema, showing the classic lead pipe appearance of colon with loss of fascia. With this clinical picture, along with the colonoscopic picture and barium enema feature, the diagnosis is ulcerative colitis. so what are the clinical features elective cases 95% present with 
loose stools with blood and mucus, abdominal pain, tenesmus with weight loss, diagnosis is confirmed by coronoscopy and biopsy. Emergency, only 5% of the cases, patient present with cramp-like abdominal pain, tenesmus, fecal urgency, blood stain, diarrhea and fecal incontinence. Plain X-ray of the abdomen twice daily to look for toxic megacolon is essential. If the diameter of the transfer colon is increasing in size, more than 6 cm, then you have to do emergency surgery, should be carried out before perforation occurs. What, when will you do the elective procedures? What is the management in acute stage? Yeah. Elective surgical option, proctocolectomy with ileostomy you can do, restorative proctocolectomy with an ileoanal pouch, IPAA plus or minus loop ileostomy, colectomy with a continent ileostomy, now we are doing it very rarely. How will you differentiate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease? So this is the, uh, this is the tabular column. So see what are the difference in symptoms and signs? What are the difference in appearance? What are the difference in the course of the disease? Ulcerative colitis, the main thing is, ulcerative colitis, you will have what is called, <coughs> uh, it will be continuous, whereas Crohn's disease, you will have skip lesions. Crohn's disease uh, is a deeper, uh, I mean, pathology, whereas ulcerative colitis is not a deep pathology. It involves only the superficial layers of the uh, bowel. So, please, uh, you, you, you can go through all these things because all this PDF will be shared with you. What are the indications for emergency and urgent operation? Failure of medical treatment during an acute exacerbation, perforation, acute toxic megacolon, severe hemorrhage. These are all indications for emergency intervention. Indication for elective operation, intractability and chronic invalidism. Risk of malignant change. Retardation of growth and development and remote or systemic complications.